That's when it started. And for the first three years, I was used as what was called an expendable child. In the Belgian network, there was a group, particularly aristocrats, who killed children. So I was a few times I was in um, situations like that, that I just happened to not be killed. So in this network, you have to understand it's a murderous network. Expendable children, that means that they can be killed. That's to say it was clear that th their lives wasn't valued so those children could be used for anything. That could, that could mean uh, they could be used for, they could be used for torture and killing. So it's very hard <laughs> to talk about what happened uh, to me during those first three years because it was very, um, extreme. Uh, so I was in uh, quite a few extreme situations. I was sometimes taken to bars and, and given to all uh, to the men there. But other times I was taken to castles to, and then waiting with a handler until the people, you know, until the first group of people had left. And then at the late hour, the younger children were brought in. Sometimes I was taken to somebody's house for the day. My mother would keep me out of school and then just drive me to somebody's house. And then whatever was necessary, I, I have remembered things about being in extreme situations with, you know, where other children did die. So my mother was being paid for this. What would happen then with an expendable child is the parents get paid. Of course, there's no contract. Nothing is in writing. It's all very vague. My mother's denial itself took care of a lot. But there was money exchanged, and her contact person was this this um, uh, countess. But let's say if I would have been killed, and you know other children were, then a doctor who was part of the network would have been able to write a certificate, a death certificate, and bring up. So in 1972, I was traded by the boss of the network to an international player, somebody who was in the international network that. The boss of the network wanted to do business with, wanted to be in this, their good favor because this was someone who was, who had global power. And this person found, apparently had this countess ask my mother who my father was and also they drew blood. Anyway, they found out that I'm from one of the bloodlines, which is something that in this Global network is very important. So this uh, uh, perpetrator then decided that he was going to get me trained, that's to say mind control trained, which is torture based, and to make me an elite slave and to even give me a platform on the world stage so I could be an elite slave to the most powerful men in the world. So elite slaves are trained, most of them are trained from a very young age. And they can be people who are actually famous, um, but are, are actually being used as slaves um, because it's all about the same kind of mafiosi style. I was being trained to spy, and also I was literally trained to make men fall in love with me at age nine. It was about a month long uh, initially, but it was really a year long. The, the whole training was a year long, and meanwhile I was already being used. I was taken to Germany on weekends and spent it with someone who I realized later was a, a very big politician in Germany at the time. I mean, I was not only did he really like me, but I was also spying on him. And I was reporting about his weakness then to who had become my owner, which was this international network. Basically, when I was going to Germany on the weekends with this um, being driven there by handlers of the Belgian network and then dropped off in places picked up by um, the on the side of the road, actually a quiet road, by the this politician. And then I would just simply drive with him. And so because I had been trained, I knew how to not be, you know, not not call attention to myself. We would He would check in and this was all this was very similar each time. It was always very idyllic, beautiful places on the beautiful rivers in Germany in some small hotel pension and there's maybe three or four rooms and so he would have the whole hotel to himself but we would sleep in the same bed and then of course it would be all it was all, it was all about pleasing him and for him 
I know that there was a great joy or, or maybe pleasure is the right, right word in having these people, you know, just fawn all over him and be so grateful and lucky that this very important person is visiting them and is gracing them with his presence and they would say that you know if if anything he would say that I'm his niece but I, of course my German I mean he actually taught me to speak German this this politician I mean better I, mean, I didn't really speak it very well so when we were alone there was a lot of buts so I had a lot to do about but he was also just very happy he seemed just very happy to be around a little girl that was there for him in this way that I was you know just lis listening I thought you know I I thought he was great and he was a really good man and that was my that was my training of course as a as a slave is to make flatter him to the max so that he would feel really good about himself and that's how he got to feel good about himself and so he clearly enjoyed the physical closeness um a lot and the warmth um and what what then appeared to be love for him I think so this one year was very peculiar that i was actually being groomed then on a big scale and my owner if i can say that uh, obviously this person who uh, wanted to own me as a slave had plans for me and 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 this was discussed even with other people in the network so it was decided i was going to be um a star in france everyone was treating me like a star you know that's really all i can say and i i had somebody who was giving me facial massages other massages but nothing creepy about these massages there were there was a photographer nothing creepy about the photo photographs even though i was naked um everybody was just making me into what i was to become which was a a french singer there was a, a singing coach there actually and i was um you know again there was nothing i could do wrong everything was positive so there was n there was no correction there, it wasn't really correction everything was it's like kind of how we are taught now to treat our kids you know to just focus on the positive but i never experienced that before and suddenly there's this voice coach and you know he 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 brings out the best out of my voice the purity of the voice and um teaching me to sing certain songs again through repetition uh, certain french songs um Edith Piaf, uh, Jacques Brel, and I was singing these songs, and it was easy. Uh, the French came back very easily. Eventually, I was going to be inducted into the cult, and so being inducted into the cult eventually was sort of my graduation, I guess, or it was to be the beginning of my new life, let's say. And there's been a lot of talk during that year about what my life was going to be, how comfortable, the most beautiful apartments in Paris the you know the best um, house on the Côte d'Azur the, the yacht the respect uh the, the platform you know everybody would think i was the best singer actress in the world and i would get all the magazine out you know it was all prepared and it was just that the what i had to do to belong eventually was just too much i um rebelled and was kicked out. Basically, I was reprogrammed and I was um extremely humiliated and um punished and um and this was reprogramming to make sure I would never become successful. After I was put back in the Belgian network, the Belgian Belgians never really discovering what had actually happened uh to me, used me for their VIPs then but a young gangster came into the network and he had power in the Belgian network because he wasn't afraid to use the gun use a gun but eventually a year later he ended up rescuing me so now it's back to my mother driving me to the network and once this gangster showed up things changed a little bit because he would keep me longer and so forth than usual and so also groomed me for six months in fact and started by protecting me and then ended up abusing me worse than anybody else um such violence and um and then you know that would have resulted in my being murdered and then he had a change of heart and then he made a deal 
with the box of the network to get me out. The physical circumstances of this gangster's name is Patrick Hamers, and um, the politician who was in charge of the network is uh, Paul van den Boenans, uh, who had a long career in politics in Belgium, and the gangster had a also quite a, a, a fascinating career in uh, crime. And the deal in 1974 that was made when this gangster was 22 years old, I think, or 23, um, was that he was going to work for the politician to get me out. He was going to become his whatever left-hand man. And what he did at age 11 is he gave me instructions for life, and they were extremely detailed. Um, he told me never to become a to never sleep with anyone for anything, never do it, uh, to that I should not become a drug addict, that I should never buy They told me I should not become an alcoholic. I could have a little wine here and there, but I should never drink too much. No hard liquor, once a week for hard liquor or some, some crazy rule like that. He told me that I should leave the country, that I should leave Belgium, that um, I have to go to Paris, London, New York, I have to settle in New York, and I should marry someone who is not an older man who made his own fortune, but someone my age who uh, is from a wealthy family, preferably a family of New York bankers. This all came out of his mouth as he was basically driving me home the last time. And, um, and of course, it included to never speak about the network, never say anything to anyone, just never do it. And these life instructions, they settled very deeply inside myself because he had done this one good act in his life. You know, he had done this thing that was selfless for me. And it was in very dramatic circumstances. And I was, these directions became sort of my guidelines for life. Um, that really got me through, that really helped me. I, he also gave me some to deal with my mother in the coming weeks, in you know the weeks that would follow, because he knew she would be angry that she couldn't take me to the network anymore. And uh, he told me to try to leave that house as soon as I could. So after, once I was rescued from the network, I really was never trafficked again. I um, followed those guidelines that have been given to me very, very uh, closely. So at age 16, I actually ended up in the red light district in Antwerp. And because of this direction, I never slept with anyone. I was able to reach high functioning levels again, and not just function well in society, but have more empathy and love for people. and really heal, um, heal as a, as a human being and as a soul. And I think it's important to look and uncover this darkness, however hard that is for each person, before we can actually create that change. And I think ultimately we are the ones that need to change.